We're in the study of the book of Zechariah, which is next to the last book of the Old Testament. And uh, we're going to begin tonight by reading from chapter 9 of Zechariah. And we'll read verses 9 and 10 of chapter 9. <coughs> Sometimes I guess the people that listen on the tape wonder what that long pause is for, but I usually wait until the rustling of the pages stop because <laughs> that usually signals that everybody's found the place. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, upon uh, a colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace uh, unto the nations, or in some translations, the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Now, we pointed out last week that in verses uh, 1 through 8 of this chapter, you have a prophecy by Zechariah of the events that would take place a uh, hundred or two years after uh, Zechariah prophesied. He prophesied this about 500, 520 years before Christ. And the events uh, covered in the first eight verses were fulfilled in the conquest of Alexander the Great, as he came from Greece, went down the uh, east coast of the, or the east side of the Mediterranean Sea, and then on down into Egypt. And uh, we're told here the cities that he uh, destroyed, conquered on the way on that conquest, and we're told that he bypassed Jerusalem. And the reason he bypassed Jerusalem is given us in secular history as well as, as some of the apocryphal books. We're told that the priest uh, uh, at Jerusalem, upon hearing that he was coming, realized that prophecy was being fulfilled, and he took the book of Daniel, uh, which refers to the conquest of Alexander the Great, and uh, he was able to show and uh, cause to understand, uh, the, the general to understand, uh, what these prophecies were about, and uh, Alexander was so thrilled to see himself in Bible prophecy, uh, and uh, having his name or having his conquest mentioned hundreds of years before he ever lived, uh, that he uh, he uh, considered Jerusalem to be a sacred city, and although he desecrated the other cities, uh, he bypassed Jerusalem, and that's what you have. Uh, uh, mentioned in verse 8, and I will encamp about my house. This is Jehovah God saying, I will encamp about my house or the temple. This was God's way of protecting it. Because of the army, that is the army of Alexander the Great, because of him that passeth by and because of him that returneth. Uh, so he passed by Jerusalem and then he returned. And uh, we had in the other verses those places uh, that he had destroyed. Now most of us will recognize the ninth verse as a prophecy concerning that which we generally call uh, the triumphal entry, uh, that which we celebrate on Palm Sunday or uh, each uh, one week before Easter every year. Now, it's very easy to, to identify this because the verse, verse 9 is quoted almost in its entirety in Matthew 21.5 and identified as that particular occasion. It's uh, mentioned, the event is mentioned and discussed uh, in quite some detail in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. And then we have a partial quotation again in the Gospel of John. So uh, all four of the Gospels refer to this, uh, uh, this verse. And in the Matthew account, it very clearly uh, sets it forth as being the fulfillment of the prophecy by the uh, by the prophet Zechariah. Now, the way God uh, let everyone know that this was a miracle uh, is that Christ specifically requested 
this little colt that had never been ridden in the gospel accounts. It makes it very, very plain to us in the Mark account and in the Luke account, and you can also gather it from the John account that the colt on which he uh, rode was a colt that had never been broken for riding. And this, of course, would take uh, more than just a, a normal situation for uh, such an animal to let himself uh, uh, act as a beast of burden. And this was uh, the sign that, uh, that God was intervening into the history of mankind. So we have maybe 300 years or so uh, between verse 8 and verse 9. Uh, I realize, of course, that there is a, uh, a far distant application also to verse 8, but you might say uh, predominantly we find that uh, there's about 300 years uh, between the first eight verses of chapter 9 and verse 9. And then we find that there are some 2,000 years between verse 9 and verse 10 because verse 10 has never happened yet. It's still future to our time. That, of course, is one of the things that makes this book of Zechariah so very, very interesting. The prophecies are pretty well interspersed in many times without regard to their actual time of happening. And since the, uh, uh, some of the prophecies have happened in minute detail, and we'll get into this further in the other chapters, we're going to see some other events that, that are recorded history. Uh, and Zechariah, prophesying hundreds of years before the event, uh, declared them uh, in, in this great detail. So this is, makes it very interesting if uh, uh, the uh, prophecies, if some of them have already been fulfilled in detail, then why should we uh, suppose that those that have not been fulfilled would be any less uh, uh, spectacular and minute in detail in, when they are fulfilled? Now there's one part of this, uh, verse 9, that we didn't uh, consider. Notice the phrase, Behold thy king. Whose king? Well, uh, the ones who are dressed are the daughters of Zion, or the daughter of Zion and the daughter of Jerusalem. This daughter of phrase is something you'll find very frequently in the prophetic scriptures. Uh, the uh, cities are, are usually referred to uh, in the Bible as mothers, uh, you know, uh, because uh, they have progeny, so to speak. Their citizenry becomes their progeny. A, a, a city goes on from generation to generation, and the uh, populace changes. And so the people are called the daughters of that particular place. Now here, Zion is that part of Jerusalem from which the government emanated. Zion was that part of Jerusalem that was called the City of David, and he was the founder, of course, of Jerusalem as the, as the capital of the Israelite people. So uh, it's just two ways of saying the same thing, the daughter of Zion and the daughter of Jerusalem, or the, the daughters of that which started from Zion, and Jerusalem being a later name with a little broader aspect, and it's just sort of following it along in sequence. So it's saying the people... Uh, who shall be here someday. Whoever will be one day in Zion and who will be in, in, um, in Jerusalem, to you I'm saying, behold thy king. Well, uh, when Zechariah prophesied, he was prophesying at Jerusalem. And uh, this event that we see here uh, happened some 500 years later. So it happened to the daughters, you might say, or the descendants of those who were the inhabitants of, uh, of Jerusalem at, at uh, Zechariah's time. Now this becomes quite interesting to us because remember back in the sixth chapter of Zechariah, we had in the in the eighth for in the sixth chapter and in the twelfth verse, remember uh, Jerusalem and Zion. All of these uh, messages are to the daughters of Zion. You can look all through it. For instance, look in uh, chapter 2, verse 10, 
sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. You'll find this type of phraseology uh, all through the, uh, the prophecy. Now look in chapter 6, verse 12. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man. Now we've had uh, in Zechariah then, Behold the man, and we have, Behold thy king. That uh, is of uh, further importance when we realize uh, several times in Isaiah this type of language was also uh, used in uh, telling about future events that would happen to Jerusalem and its people. For instance, you want to hold your place in Zechariah and turn uh, for a moment back in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, you'll remember in Isaiah 40 we have the prophecy of the ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, for instance, in uh, Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John the Baptist, when he came upon the scene, he says, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy by uh, Isaiah. I am that voice that crieth in the wilderness. Then the prophet Isaiah, by the way, Isaiah prophesied maybe 200 and some years previous to Zechariah, or 700 and some years before Christ. But uh, notice again, down in the ninth verse of this 40th chapter of Isaiah, O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Now we have three of these uh, uh, attention getters. Behold means uh, take notice or prick up your ears because what is going to be said is very important. And uh, Jerusalem, the daughters of Jerusalem, the daughters of Zion were told then to behold the man, behold thy king, and here behold your God. Now let's turn over to uh, Isaiah chapter 42. Now, if you look back in the, in the uh, verses just before the chapter division, that would be 4127, you see again we're addressing the same group of people. Uh, the first shall say to Zion, Behold, behold them, I will give to Jerusalem. You've got the message going out to the same people. Now look in chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant. Now this is Jehovah talking to the daughters of Zion, to the daughters of Jerusalem. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, or in whom I am well pleased, I have put my spirit upon him. Now this becomes quite interesting when we uh, realize that in Matthew chapter 12, in verses 18 through 21, Jesus Christ quoted these first three verses in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 42. And he told his listeners at that time, this was uh, fairly early in his ministry on earth, when he quoted these first three verses in Isaiah 42, he told his listeners that these verses were about him. It was about the time, uh, he said, uh, that he was coming uh, to be a servant. And uh, he wasn't going to cry out loud or lift up his voice. Uh, he wasn't going to come in with a roar. Uh, in verse 3 of this 42nd chapter, a bruised reed uh, shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment and truth. Now Jesus says this is about him. So now we have five of, uh, four of these beholds. Uh, we can repeat this one again in chapter 52 of Isaiah. And in chapter 52... Notice again uh, the way it starts. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy be beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee uh, uh, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from thy bands, uh, the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Now you see what uh, Jehovah God is doing. He's telling these people, I know that you're in rather... A dire straits now, and the times are going to get worse before they're going to get better. But if you'll look over that, uh, something great's going to happen. 
and he says, uh, my servant's going to come. See, this uh, 13th verse of the 52nd chapter, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. And then if we read on here, we can know that the verses from Isaiah 52, 13, all the rest of the way through the 53rd chapter are descriptive of the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly in his first coming, but they also extend into his second coming. Now, we needn't wonder about this at all because these verses are quoted quite frequently in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, uh, you'll remember the story in Acts chapter 8 where the uh, uh, gentleman from Africa uh, that we uh, call the Ethiopian eunuch, he was riding in a chariot. He'd been to Jerusalem seeking uh, a spiritual fulfillment. And uh, uh, he had uh, uh, come to Jerusalem, and now he was going back to Africa, and all he had for his search was a little scroll. And he was riding along his chariot, reading this scroll. And uh, God directed Philip the deacon, or Philip the evangelist, uh, uh, to accost him. And the Holy Spirit took Philip up and deposited him, deposited him by this chariot in which this African nobleman was riding. And there he sat in the chariot. You can read all this. It's in the 8th chapter of Acts. Uh, there he sat in the chariot, reading. And Philip uh, walks up alongside, and he says, Do you understand what you're reading? And the man looked at him down from the chariot and says, How can I except some man should tell me? And uh, then he goes on to say, and he says, Tell me something. Is this prophet speaking of himself? Or is he speaking of someone else? And we're told that Philip took the book, and at the same place he began to read and preached unto him Jesus. Now that's the story. So we needn't wonder at all. We have, uh, there should be no doubt whatsoever, except that these verses uh, beginning in uh, uh, Isaiah 52, 13, extending through, Isaiah 53, that these verses are speaking of the person of Jesus Christ. And he is called here Jehovah's servant. So now back to uh, uh, Zechariah in this chapter 9 9. We have then this fourfold uh, pronouncement, or this uh, uh, fourfold directive uh, to behold. Jehovah says, in each case, he's saying uh, to uh, the descendants, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those uh, particularly uh, who worship in Jerusalem. He's saying, in, on the one hand, if we take it as it comes, beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, he says, Behold your God. And uh, if you recall, when John the Baptist pointed out Jesus Christ in the first chapter of John, he not only called him the Lamb of God, but he also called him the Son of God. So uh, we have, Behold your God. Then as we progress on in Isaiah, it's, Behold my servant, the servant of Jehovah. And then as we get into Zechariah, first, Behold the man. And then in our ninth chapter of Zechariah, Behold your king. Now, you have the answer to these three, or the fulfillment of these four, beholds, in the four Gospels. Because Matthew is, Israel, behold your king, your king cometh. It's the, it's the Gospel that portrays Jesus Christ as the rejected king. Now, it shouldn't be hard for us to tell this at all. For instance, the book starts with the genealogy of Jesus Christ and traces his kingly line from Abraham and David. Doesn't fill in all between because Messiah only need be the descendant of Abraham and David, but he must be both of those. And so we have his genealogy in the first chapter of, uh, of Matthew to give his royal lineage. If one is to be a king, you need to know uh, his lineage for that establishes his right to the throne. And then, of course, Matthew is the only gospel that uh, mentions the regal gifts. You won't find the story of the potentates from the East in, uh, in, in any of the other gospels. They'd be out of place there because Matthew is particularly the story of the king that came and was rejected. And you'll find the whole gospel 
is is uh, written uh, with that type of a uh, of a slant to it. It, it's, it is. Behold, thy king cometh. Behold your king, Israel. Israel beheld and rejected. They said, we'll not have this man to reign over us. And then, as we progress on to Mark, we have the fulfillment of, Behold my servant. Now, if you'll notice, in the Gospel of Mark, you start right out with the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. You start him out in his adulthood. His uh, birth is not mentioned. His lineage is not mentioned. Uh, his childhood is not mentioned. You're not interested in birth or lineage. You're, and when you're speaking of a servant, all you need know is, can he do what needs to be done? Who asks for the pedigree of a servant? No. Is his arm strong enough? And his, is his mind willing enough? And the whole gospel of Matthew is presented as Jesus Christ doing the bidding of the Father. Behold my servant. And then as you go on into the uh, uh, Gospel of Luke, you have Behold the man, because Luke is preeminently the story of the human Jesus. And this also shouldn't be hard for us to uh, determine, because uh, you have a genealogy there. But the genealogy there is not as the son of Abraham and the son of David, but as the son of Adam. He is that one of Adam's race. And uh, it's the story of how uh, our fellow human being came and, uh, and gave his life for us. Uh, the genealogy in Luke is, uh, is through Mary rather than through Joseph and through uh, uh, the, uh, the kingly lineage. Uh, because, you see, it was Mary who established humani his humanity. Joseph did not. Joseph had, didn't have anything to do with his humanity. But there's the story of the human, the human Jesus. Did you know there's more mention of the prayer life of Christ in Luke, far more in Luke than all the other three Gospels combined? Because as it's as a human being, a fellow human being, he prayed to the Father. And uh, uh, it's the only gospel that will tell you anything about his childhood after, after he was a baby. Because those things are of human interest. It's the human story. Uh, here again, you have his birth. If you were going to tell the story of a human being, if you were going to write a, a biography... You would tell of his lineage, and you'd tell of his uh, where he was born, and 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 you'd tell the circumstance of his of his birth. Or it really wouldn't be the story, would it, of an individual? So uh, uh, that's needed there. Then, as you get to the Gospel of John, you have behold your God, and in the Book of John, Jesus Christ is presented as God, and whereas Matthew, you might say. Uh, starts with Abraham and uh, Mark starts with the adulthood of Jesus Christ and Luke starts with Adam uh, you will find that uh, John starts with the beginningless beginning and the birth of Christ would be entirely out of place in John because it's not the story per se of the humanity of Christ but of his godhood God came down. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then later on, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning, what beginning? The beginningless beginning. And uh, the Gospel of John uh, establishes his everlastingness, you might say, the eternal Godhood of Christ. So you have uh, <clears throat> the Lord presented from those four different aspects in the four Gospels. But the interesting thing is that the uh, prophets of old, that is to say specifically Isaiah and Zechariah, 
said that this would be so. Uh, so hundreds of years before the first gospel was ever written, it was prophesied that there would be four gospels. Now to me this is rather marvelous. And uh, it causes uh, my innermost being to cry out, surely my God has spoken. And it makes me most interested. I just know that human authors don't do things this way. I've read enough to know that the mind of man didn't uh, think this up. This came from my God, and that's of great comfort to me, that my God has cared for me, and my God has spoken uh, to me uh, through the pages of this book. Let's progress on to, uh, to verse 10. Jehovah is speaking now, and he says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. Now here's something that will help your understanding of these prophetic scriptures. Uh, sometimes the northern ten tribes are called Israel, sometimes they're called Ephraim, and sometimes they're called Samaria. Sometimes the southern tribes are called Judah, and sometimes they're called Jerusalem. Now here's why. The predominant tribe of the southern kingdom was Judah, and the capital was in uh, the domain of Judah, or between Benjamin and Judah, Judah, and the capital was Jerusalem. So sometimes uh, we speak of a whole country by naming its capital. For instance, if you want to uh, speak of a, de a declaration, uh, you'd say, and London says, or uh, Moscow says. Well, you mean some spokesman from that country said it. Or Hanoi has declared. You've seen that language in our modern time. So sometimes the capital city stands for the whole nation. And so sometimes it's Judah, sometimes it's Jerusalem. On the other hand, the ten northern tribes uh, are spoken of as Israel sometimes because it means the rest of Israel, other than this uh, one that is, uh, has the true capital at Jerusalem. But sometimes it's called Ephraim because Ephraim was the predominant tribe, the ruling tribe and the predominant tribe of the northern ten tribes, and the capital of the north was in the domain of Ephraim, and the capital city was Samaria. Uh, so sometimes it carries that name. And uh, uh, sometimes they use the tribal name for one and, and the city, the capital name for the other, which is done here. But it, it's speaking of both. It's, it's speaking of the whole of Israel, which was separated at the time, it had been separated at the time of Zechariah since uh, for several hundred years. And what he's saying here is, I will cut off the chariot and the horse. That is, the time's going to come when nobody will ever again fight against these people. That's what he's saying. And the battle bow shall be cut off. He's saying the time is going to be in the future when nobody will ever war against this people. That hasn't happened yet. People are warring against them in our day. So the tenth verse has not yet been fulfilled. Let's read on. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen. Now, this word translated heathen is variously translated in the Bible, heathen, Gentiles, and nations, because uh, they all three had the same connotation at that time. A heathen nation was any nation but Israel, because all other nations disregarded the one true God. And uh, the nations meant all of the nations of the world other than Israel. And the Gentiles meant the same thing. So, some places you will have it translated heathen, sometimes nations and sometimes Gentiles, and it's the same original word, and it just happens that the translator liked one uh, better than the other. But it's saying that he, somebody, shall speak peace to the nations, and his dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Now the he here is the Messiah that shall come. 
and he's going to speak peace. He has not done that yet. When, when, for when he speaks peace, that's declaring that there will be peace. And that's not true yet. But it will be. Because he's the prince of peace. And his dominion. The, really the story of the Bible is the story of how man lost and shall regain dominion over the earth. Now if you want to know a theme for the whole Bible, that's it. God gave him dominion uh, in Genesis chapter 1. And you have the consummation of his regaining of dominion in Revelation chapter 22. And man will regain dominion in Jesus Christ. And this is prophesied all through the Bible. You can follow that word dominion right through from one end of the Bible to the other. Uh, for instance, you have it in the 8th Psalm where David was told that dominion would come through his progeny. And uh, he was so delighted with that till he wrote the 8th Psalm. And then the writer of the book of Hebrews, a thousand years later, quotes from the 8th Psalm. And he says, well, God says man's going to have dominion, but we don't see everything under man's dominion yet. But we see Jesus. So it's this one who will regain dominion. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea. Now this means from the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Now I, I didn't put my maps up here tonight, but uh, I had them up last time because I thought I was going to get to this verse and didn't. So we're really behind time, aren't we? Uh, anyway, in... Uh, chapter 15 of Genesis, God gave Abraham a promise. And he says, Abraham, your progeny will possess a particular land. And then he describes the boundaries of this land. And Abraham was told that the boundaries would extend from the Euphrates River. And the Euphrates River was called the river. Everybody but Egypt called the Euphrates the river. That's all they called it. In Egypt, they called the Nile the river. So in the Bible, many times, you'll see the river, and you have to figure out whether it's the Nile or the Euphrates. It will be dependent upon which area they're speaking out of, because everybody, you see, the Euphrates River was the only large river in that whole area. Somebody says, well, how about the Tigris? Well, the Tigris is simply a tributary of the Euphrates. And the Euphrates River, some 2,000 miles long, starts way up in Asia Minor, curls around and so forth, and it's that great mammoth river uh, the center of the, what we call the Fertile Crescent. And so the Euphrates is the river. But the people of Egypt don't call the Euphrates the river. To them, there's not but one river. And that's an equally uh, uh, magnificent body of water, and they call the river the Nile. In fact, is the word Nile means river in one language. So the river, when you see it in the Bible... You have to decide. Now, we have the phrase here, the river. Well, you've got to decide. This is either the Nile River or it's the Euphrates River. So which is it, you say? Well, uh, if you knew uh, the scriptures that uh, gave, uh, gave the description of the boundaries of the land of Israel and other places, you'd know that this is speaking of the Euphrates River. <coughs> That was the river that was designated when Abraham was first given the promise of the boundaries of the land. Now, you may be confused when you see the boundaries of the land of Israel described because there are two definite, different uh, delineations of that boundary. You see, it was God's purpose to bring the nation of Israel into this small protected area which extended from sea to sea, that's the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, and from Dan to Beersheba. Uh, that describes it from east to west and from north to south. And uh, the... Uh, I guess I ought to get out these maps. I suppose this type of an episode confuses the people that listen on the tapes, too. But uh, they'll have to be patient, won't they? Uh, See, blue, over on this side is the Mediterranean Sea. 
in the small blue here is the Dead Sea. And for these purposes, the whole Jordan River complex, which includes the Sea of Galilee up here and so forth, are part of the Dead Sea complex. And the land of Israel extended from sea to sea. Those were the east and the west boundaries. The north and south boundaries were Dan, which is right there, to Beersheba, which is right here. It would be the yellow, purple, and pink sections there that you see in a row between the two seas. Now that's from sea to sea and from Dan to Beersheba. You'll see that descriptive delineation again and again in the scriptures when it's speaking about all the people of Israel and all of the promised land. But other times you'll see it described as from the river even unto Egypt or the river even under the Red Sea, <coughs> or from the, uh, from the river, even unto uh, the river of Egypt. Uh, and that's uh, a much larger area, several times larger. Let's see if I can find a map that will give us that description better. So as you read through the scriptures, you're going to find two entirely separate uh, boundary descriptions. Maybe we can find it here. You see, this huge river here, this is the Euphrates. And from the river down to Egypt would be a, a huge area. All right, here was God's plan. It was God's plan that Israel should come within the borders of that smaller area. This from sea to sea and from Dan to Beersheba. And that they should... Uh, conquer all the people in that land and they should stay in that land because it was very protected. It was protected on every side from enemies. It was almost inaccessible to an enemy. And they were to go behind those borders until they learned their God and understood what his program was in the world. And then he promised them, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, when you do this, I will enlarge your borders to the total land that was promised to Abraham. And so when God brought the children of Israel over across the Jordan, some of them wanted to stay on the other side, but he made it very clear that wasn't the place of blessing. You had to go over Jordan. You had to go between the seas and between Dan and Beersheba. And then later he would expand their borders. Now he did just that under the kingdoms of David and Solomon. And under those two kings, the borders were approximately the size of the land as it was promised to Abraham, but not entirely. The complete fulfillment of that descriptive border that he gave in the 15th chapter of Genesis to Abraham is yet to be fulfilled. So when you see two different types of borders described for the land, uh, one, the narrow borders uh, uh, delineate that uh, protected area into which they were to come until they learned their God and then their borders were to be enlarged. Now here, when it speaks of a dominion that shall be from sea to sea and from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the ends of the earth, it's speaking of a worldwide domain spoken of by the prophet Daniel. And that could only be under the Messiah himself, the coming Christ. And so we have in this 10th verse a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. If we took the time to look up all of these situations, I suppose uh, we'd be studying Zechariah when the rapture comes. But uh, uh, some of it we just, uh, we just have to describe to you. Verse 11, and for thee, that's Jerusalem, that's who he's talking about when he says thee, and for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I, will, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit in which is no water. Turn to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Now this is God speaking to the children of Israel and saying that I have made a blood covenant. In other words, this is something you can count on. And I know that you're like prisoners in a pit without any water. 
And Israel as a nation has been just that for centuries. But they say, you're not prisoners without a hope. You're prisoners with a hope, in verse 12. And if you'll only turn to your stronghold. Now, this is a reference back to the Song of Moses in, uh, in, in um, Deuteronomy chapter 32. And uh, proclaimed uh, by David in numerous of his psalms. Their fortress, their stronghold is their God. So when Israel turns uh, to their stronghold, then he will render them double or twice as much as they ever dreamed of, uh, even though uh, they seem now to be prisoners in a pit. Because God has given a blood covenant. And you can be sure that that covenant will be fulfilled. Verse 13, When I have bent Judah for me, filled uh, the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee like a sword of a mighty man. Now Greece, very often in prophetic scriptures, speaks of all of the Gentile nations which would oppress Israel because, you see, they were the next oppressors after Zechariah prophesied. You see, there's these four great world kingdoms, the Babylonians, then the Medio persians then the Greeks, then the Romans. Those are the four horns that we found earlier in Zechariah that, that scattered Israel, so to speak. And... Uh, Babylonia and Medio Persia have already come on the scene in Zechariah's time and moved off of the scene. And the next one on the scene is Greece. And of course, uh, the Grecian kingdom encompassed the civilized world. And uh, so it was, it was uh, Israel against the nations. And with Israel, it's always been that way. It's that way today. Why, do you think for a minute, if the nations of the world decide they want to go down there and try to wipe Israel off the map, that Israel's going to have any friends? Listen, maybe from a human standpoint, 20 years ago, we'd have got all excited and sent somebody over there to fight for them. It never happened now. That's what Vietnam is all about. You'd never get the American people stirred up to fight anybody's war. There's nobody to protect Israel. The whole world is against Israel as a nation. And uh, it says here, though, that one day it's going to be as though God used Judah for a bow. See, when I have bent Judah, it's speaking of like an archer when he bends a bow. So Judah's going to be the bow, and Ephraim is going to be the arrow. See, I have bent Judah for me and filled the bow with Ephraim. The thought is this, that God's going to have a war. And the bow is going to be jo Judah, and Ephraim's going to be the arrow. You get the picture? You see the, uh, uh, the imagery there? And uh, uh, so uh, he's going to turn it against the nations of the world, as is epitomized here, or as, uh, I mean, uh, represented by Greece. And uh, raise thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee like the sword of a mighty man. Well, God is the mighty man. You see, God plus anybody is a majority. And the nations of the world are going to find this out. And so it won't make any difference how insignificant that somebody else is. Uh, he'll use uh, whatever he wants to for a bow and an arrow. And that'll be the win inside. And it's a good idea uh, to be on God's side. Uh, well, that's, uh, uh, that's my uh, sage saying for the night. Uh, verse 14. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth like lightning. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of, of the south. Now this is talking about when Jesus Christ comes back, 
at the end of the tribulation in that which we call the Battle of Armageddon. All the nations of the world would be gathered against Jerusalem. Now, Zechariah is going to give us a much more detailed account of that in the 14th chapter. So if you don't think we're covering, or covering it enough now, wait till we get uh, to the 14th chapter because he's going to expand upon this matter of his bow and arrow, uh, which we see here. Uh, don't you love the, the imagery, the, I mean, the, the picturesque speech here uh, that God uses? This is, this is beautiful literature. Well, I'm telling you. Uh, they sure did literature a disservice when they said you're not supposed to read the Bibles in the Bible in the school. There's no literature in the world like this. They're not going to find that type of, uh, of literature if they had anybody that explained to them what it meant. Um, I don't know what those little grunts are about. <clears throat> this, verse 15. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, that is Israel, and they shall devour and subdue the sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as, as through wine and shall be filled like bowls and like the corners of the altar. Now, you'd have to understand uh, how the sacrificial altar was in order to understand that. You see, they slew the animals and there was drains on the corners and there were bowls that the blood drained into the bowls. And uh, it's just the picture of uh, somebody's going to get their blood drained on the sacrificial altar if they keep on doing what they're doing. And that's what the, uh, the imag imagery is here. And they shall be filled like bowls, like the corners of the altar. Their blood's going to be spilled, in other words. That means the enemies of Israel, those upon whom the bow and the arrow will be turned. Verse 16. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. And they shall be like the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. Now the thought is here that, uh, uh, that the Messiah is going to wear a crown. And he's going to have some jewels in the crown. And those who have been faithful uh, in his, uh, among his people will be like jewels in the crown. That's not, that's not the only place that's used. The stones in the crown here uh, means jewels. Uh, hold the place here a moment. Turn over to the next book, which is Malachi. Look in chapter 3 of Malachi. We can start with verse 16, Malachi 3.16. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard. Uh, and the book of remembrance was written before him uh, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. In other words, when I uh, want to put some jewels in my crown, I'm going to make them up. Uh, with uh, these that, that I've chosen. This is the, the imagery that we have here. Back in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 17. For how great is thy goodness, and how great is thy beauty! Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. When Jesus partook of the Lord's Supper, there just before the night of his crucifixion, he says, uh, I will not any more drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my kingdom. And that's what we have reference to here. And we're not going to have time to do much in chapter 10, but uh, I want us to consider something that's quite important in, uh, in verse 1, and uh, we'll close on that note. Uh, Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1, Ask the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Now, some of you are using a, a modern translation, probably, and where the King James says the latter rain, uh, your Bible says the spring rain. Anybody have a, a Bible that says that? I need to make a comment. That nobody like that. Nobody has a new American standard, for instance. You have it. Anybody else? Where it says the spring rain. 
Well, I point this out. One of the better of the modern translations would be the New American Standard that he's using here. And uh, you have one problem, even in the very best of them. Now, let, let me explain to you. The word here is latter in the original and not spring, but it so happens that it's a spring rain. So the translator wants to do part of your thinking for you, and that's the problem with so many translators. They don't want to just translate. They want to think for you, too. They say, well, now, uh, uh, you see, well, first let's uh, uh, talk about rain in the land of Israel. Every year, the rain in Israel in a normal year will start somewhere the latter part of October or the first part of November. And it will rain off and on, I don't mean every day, but the rains will last into the spring of the year, uh, into April. And then there will not be one single drop of rain for May, June, July, August, and September. Usually a six months period, or very nearly a six months period, not one drop of rain in that land. Now, as soon as the early rains come, they can start plowing the ground. That'll be in the fall. Because uh, before the rain starts, the land is very hard and untillable. And it just lays uh, out there waiting. But as soon as the rains come, they can start tilling it. And uh, then it, as soon as the days start to get longer, even as, as early as February, they start planting because it's a relatively mild climate there, and they're, uh, they're, they have some cold days, but usually they come in December and January. And usually by the, uh, the uh, middle of February, they can start planting. Now, because the ground will be soft and moist, and because it's uh, very fertile, well, the crops will just spring forth. But if the rains stop too soon, there won't be any harvest. It takes the latter rains or the spring rains to bring the crops to maturity. They'll be planting, they'll be plowing, they'll be planting, and they'll be growing, but no fruition. And they won't harvest any grain because the rains stop too soon. That's great if the rains will stop on time because then it'll be nice sunny days to uh, to harvest the, the grain and so forth, and we'll have to worry about it uh, mildewing and getting wet, and it'll keep for uh, months and months out in the fields. No problems at all. It's great. But let the rain stop just a month early, and you got problems because the plant life will draw all the moisture out of the ground before the grain comes into fruition. And so in the Bible, the latter rain is used sometime typically. Well, when it's translated spring, which it is a spring rain, it loses all of its typical meaning because spring doesn't mean anything. It means a different thing typically. And that's why God says latter instead of spring. So you won't get the typology mixed up. But you know, the translators, they say, well now, you know, these poor people that read this Bible, they're not very bright, and if we say latter rain, that won't mean much to them, and they probably wouldn't get the spiritual significance anyway, and it'll really be nice, much nicer if we say spring rain, and, and then they'll, uh, they'll get the, uh, the, the point that it was a rain that fell in the spring. And you find this over and over again in the modern translations. You find it some even in the King James, but the, the difference is, if you find something like that in the King James, somebody has already cleared it up for you in the margin. And, and, and let you know uh, what the original word really meant. Now, in the Hebrew language, there's a, there's a word for spring, and there's a word for latter. And this word is the word for latter, although it is a spring rain. So, well, I think I'm fighting a losing battle uh, on this modern language as teaching the Bible, I might have told you folks, I was teaching the Bible up in a conference in Georgia in November, and uh, I said something that uh, I shouldn't have said, I suppose, about uh, the advantages over the King James Version to some of the modern versions, and it so happens that some of the men that had come to the conference were using one of the modern versions to instruct some newer Christians and all. And 
He thought that was pretty good, pretty bad. I was, he was just sort of discredited in the eyes of his disciples. And so, well, I doubt if I'll get invited back to South Georgia to the Bible conference. But <laughs> anyway, uh, now, just to show you that there is significance, my goodness, it's two minutes after nine. Next time together, we'll tell about the significance of the latter rain. How about that? Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to uh, get involved, look up this term in your concordance, the latter rain. Uh, I'll give you two key places. One would be the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, and another would be the second chapter of Joel. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get involved in it there uh, next time. Father, we thank you again for this matchless word. We thank you for this time together with those who love what you say and are exercised by it.